Viking and State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy is joining us for our weekly Tacky Talks. Hey, Tacky, what's going on? Hey, Joe, good to see you. Uh, it's been busy in world affairs and Congress still doesn't function. And uh, at least uh, Massachusetts still hums along, uh, despite what people have uh, think about this and that. The news media's desire to make it sound like we're not doing anything. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're no, relative to the rest of the planet, we're doing pretty good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> well, take take QATV out of the news media. <laughs> we certainly know you're doing something. Yeah, and it's a sunny. It's yeah, it finally got a sunny day uh, for for a little while longer. Yeah, did you have a good three day weekend? Kind of yes, kind of no. Uh, you know, had um, it wasn't what did they do Friday? I'm losing track of time. Oh, Friday was Korea Day. So uh, as I, you all know, I got my COVID flu shots. Some of you may know this, but you know I did get my vaccination. It did wear me down, but I did check myself this day. That was for Korea Day, which uh, October is uh, the month where uh, Korea was founded. It actually, tracked their calendar back uh, to the very uh, day of foundation of the country. And um, you know, we celebrated Korea Day. The Foundation Korean Korean Culture State House you know, went in and said some words about uh, the importance of not being forgotten and. You know, when we talk about, you know, the people's house, which is the state house, not all people have been to the state house, which I strongly encourage in the visits, such incredible historical site. Um, but also that, you know, people don't know it's that welcoming. And, uh, and you know, we still have to work it uh, for everyone, not just for some of us. And uh, it's a very, I'm making a very broad statement, but it's actually quite true. You know, people should... You know, definitely come to the state house and it's open to all despite the metal detectors and the security we have um and you know to you know appreciate you know, one of the oldest running democracies democratic republics you know in the world is actually out of massachusetts so that was that and you know it's, it's some of my condolences to Anne mahoney and her family you know mary mulligan passed away you know, stopped by that week on the way home on friday took some phone calls in the car but uh because that's what you do in cars these days you catch up on on business calls. And then um, Saturday, my friend Conan Suhu, who's now leading the Asian Realtors, Asian Real Estate uh, Area, Asian Real Estate uh, Association, um, Massachusetts chapter, had an event at the Old Boston Globe on uh, financial education and um, first time home buying. We had to stop in there, did my grocery shopping and whatnot afterwards. Uh, it rained pretty heavily, as you all know, so I was out there trying to get my errands done. And then um, Sunday was quiet, and Monday was Taiwan Day. Um, I was at the Park Plaza Hotel on on uh, Monday night, Boston Park Plaza, uh, which is ten ten day in Taiwan. It's ten ten. It's the international timeline. So the uh, October tenth is the day when uh, Sun Yat Sen and uh, you know the forces of uh, movement for democratic China, you know, un unseated the empire, the, the end of the dynasties. Uh, and people like, you know, Mao Zedong and uh, Sun Yat-sen and uh, Chiang Kai-shek and many, many other uh, local uh, leaders and warlords, let's call them mm -hmm. minutes, um, you know, consolidated to take down the empire. So October 10 is the day that happened uh, and the declaration of the Republic of China and the attempt to uh, create its first republic um, under Sun Yat-sen. So uh, that was... Um, uh, Monday night with colleagues and uh, with the new director general from Taiwan and a uh, good chance to see some folks, but it was a little bit thin. It was a little bit thin attendance, largely because it's a long weekend. Right. So it's new England legislators from the six states, at least have at least one representative. Um, and of course, learn a lot of people from the Chinatown leadership and um, a lot of veterans um, will, will show up as well as some of the you know, older generation of veterans that actually you know fought in the uh, communist fought against the communists uh, back in the 50s as they continue to pass on because of just age. Um, and of course, we just talked a little bit earlier before we started, you know, when an, another person of a past generation is Frank Chin from Chinatown, the last of the last gen, last of that generation of leaders uh, in Chinatown at age 91. His brother Billy passed away, I believe, uh, two years ago. So, you know, again, uh, time moves on and uh, change is coming uh, even in Chinatown leadership structure. Mm hmm so is, ten, is ten ten considered Independence Day for Taiwan or no? No, it's considered Independence Day for all of China. Both oh, the okay. Chinese uh, Communist Party as well as the Taiwan government actually and actually all Chinese 
uh, for the purposes of uh, ending the uh, empire. I said, uh, that's the day it had in the Declaration of Republic. Of course, Taiwan is referred to as the Republic of China uh, under uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And then you have the People's Republic of China, which is Mao Zedong, and you had that a prolonged civil war after um, the death of Sun Yat-sen, who was holding it all together, um, mm. the, again, power vacuum. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the, uh, the Chiang Kai-shek group was called nationalists, and then the uh, Communist Party, so the Communist Party with Mao Zedong. Right. So uh, as you all know your history, um, you know, the communist uh, was able to win that war essentially by pushing the uh, Nationalist Party into what we now know as Taiwan. And that's that's what we treated to. Um, and, you know, many folks that supported them, especially Southeast China, you know, all had to flee into places elsewhere, such as Singapore, um, Macau, Hong Kong, Australia, um, basically anywhere else they could uh, find a, a place to escape to with, with nothing with the, other they could carry. Although, uh, all the fact, if you go visit Taiwan, um, you will actually find one of the largest archives of Chinese artifacts. One of the things that Chiang Kai-shek did was took everything that was bolted down in Beijing uh, on the way out the door of artifacts. Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, there's actually probably more antiquities in Taiwan than actually in China itself, given mm-hmm. the volume of stuff that he ran off with. And remember, this is like 1952. Um, it's not easy to transport all that stuff in 1952 in a war zone. Right. Hmm. Interesting. But Taiwan now is independent, right? Taiwan's not a country. It's never been a conventional country. Yeah. Oh. For, yeah. I mean, let me rephrase that. The countries aren't actually defined how people think it is because there's no real method of defining a country. You know, you could go into some barren island and declare it as Joe Catalano land, you know, citizen one, right? Yeah. But, it's, it's really about where you fit in the global world, and there's no, like, clean definition. So, like, if you look at what's a country like this Transnistria, which is a little gap in Moldova to Ukraine, which the Russians control, declared themselves a country, but who actually recognized, right? The Vatican is considered a country in a weird place, which has literally no resources. Right. Uh, the tiniest country in the planet, the Vatican, right? So, but, you know, do they get, you know, you know, free trade status, right? Are they part of the EU treaty seats, right? Do they get to declare war, right? I mean, no. this, yeah, this is complex. It's not as simple as what thinks what a country is. So people use the yeah. UN to definition of a country, right? They say, oh, if you're a UN member, you're a country. Is it? Because, you know, until uh, Nixon and Kissinger normalized relations with China, mm-hmm. China was Taiwan for the purposes of, of uh, the, how do you put this, the, the agreement between the United States and the Soviets to try to maintain some balance. You know, all these agreements were made and compromised, try to prevent World War III, including right. the composition. And Security Council composition was part of that, part of those discussions. And, uh, you know, Taiwan was recognized as China, the Republic of China. Uh, and uh, the, But the big part of China, which is where all the people and military and, and the largest landmass wasn't recognized as China, and to Nixon Kissinger to cut the deal to allow the China uh, People's Republic of China into the UN and put them on a security counter and booted Taiwan. I see. But Taiwan is a top 20 GDP economy. You know, it's a top 10 trading partner in the US. It, it, you know, and I think it's a top, I think it's number eight, maybe eight or nine, I think. It's been a while since looking at numbers, but I mean they're also a top 15, I know that much. Trading partner in Massachusetts, they have their, uh, they have a republic. That's been there since the end of dictator rule. They actually had you know military dictator rule to the mid eighties, mm-hmm. uh, and then they formed a, a proper republic. Um, they are a trading partner globally. They have their own passport visa systems. Mm-hmm. So in all ways, they function like a country, but it's not recognized by a country by the United Nations, mm-hmm. and other countries don't recognize them, so they don't get things like diplomatic immunity. Okay, but they they have their own government though, right? Separate from China. Yeah, they're a functional government. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a quirky issue. So, you know, as you all hear in the news, it's kind of like, you know, one China policy is recognized, but not is recognized, but not accepted is okay. vagueness okay. of language. Right. Yeah. So when they put together these laws and agreements between, you know, not just in Congress regarding trade agreements, but also with with China. You know, the, the diplomacy of it all is that the balancing act with this stuff and it's. Um, you know, it's we all recognize that you know one China policy, but we don't 
uh, acknowledge that uh, Taiwan uh, is not its own little thing in, in mm-hmm. China. We refer to Taiwan as a rogue state. And in China, they consider Taiwan being part of China, uh, even though they really don't have control over it. And they mm-hmm. actually have a trade agreement between the two, and they have their own a travel passports between the two until oh. relations really got sour the last five or so years. It's been a long sour. This is not just like recent. Right. And, you know, of course, the Chinese uh, government um, has a much more moralized military. This isn't the military 50 years ago where a, a land invasion of Taiwan would have been catastrophic because they literally didn't have any equipment that would be equivalent to what you see today. Right, um, right. But also, it's still an island. I mean, it only has like maybe two and a half months of decent weather for mm-hmm. uh, naval, tri- uh, you know, like small naval uh, transcursions of large quantities. But you know, now you have air power like they've never seen before. And uh, but it's also the most important strategic location for trade. Eighty percent mm-hmm. of all trade between Taiwan, Korea, you know, and you know, growing up and down that area, you know, to Southeast Asia, to Australia, to India, you know, comes through Taiwan Strait. Yep. You control the Taiwan Strait waters and the international law because there is a maritime law regarding you know how much water people can have around them is the economic development zone they can control. You know, the Chinese could control, you know, the Chinese government could control the entire um access point for you know all that trade that moves through. And you know, we're talking about one of the economies, the third biggest economy in the planet is still the Japanese. I think the Koreans are the sixth biggest. Okay. So, you know, the Chinese could literally strangle. Um, trade or force uh, different tariffs or uh, trade agreements with the Koreans and the Japanese yeah. uh, to their favor in exchange for, for access to waterways. Taiwan's best interest allow everybody through because it keeps your friends, right? You know, yes. don't, don't make it difficult. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's also, it's been really tense around the world and Taiwan's no separation. And the Chinese government's Proving to Taiwan, they can get to the other side of the island. If you look in the map, you know, obviously the protected side is the side that faces mainland China. Right. But, you know, they've been flying um, planes and moving ships to the far side and the Pacific side of the uh, island uh, to show that they can come from the back. But, you know, you guys all seen you know, Ukraine, uh, you know, wars, land war that's, uh, you know, now really gone into year, deep into year two. And uh, it ain't easy. Uh, fighting a war, and um, and now we have one in Israel, and um, we are uh, aware that Israel is one of the most um, prepared militaries in the planet. So when they're ready to go, you come three hundred fifty thousand reservists who are, you know, have uh, uh, national pride, and now you have a terror attack in a station where, you know, much like you saw in the U.S., everyone's signing up, you know, or going back to Israel somehow, um, you know, to defend their nation. So. Um, the geopolitics a little bit in Asia. We have the Japanese Korean factor. You have the Filipino factor. You've seen it use the Filipinos keep provoking Chinese ships that uh, that the uh, Philippines consider to be inside their own territorial waters. Um, and countries like Vietnam and others are trying to you know change relationship with the United States because you know they they, they want better not just trade relations but also greater um, security in their also the South China Sea in their territorial waters too, which the United States will recognize and have recognized. Yeah. And they patrol for pirates. I mean, you know, people forget the US Navy isn't just floating around out there, uh, you know, carrying planes and, you know, equipment. They actually do police international waters against pirates, rescue missions, uh, safety of trade, uh, response to emergencies um, of all types. So, you know, the US Navy is still the most powerful Navy in the planet in blue water, deep water, but China doesn't need to go deep water. They're not a deep water country. Right. Very few countries are deep water countries. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Israel. I think a lot of folks are surprised. That it seems that Israel got caught by surprise, caught off guard. Yeah. I mean, obviously we're getting a lot of different news reports and, you know, Israeli intelligence, you know, is some of the best on the planet. So, yeah, everyone was very surprised that this happened. Um, I'm sure Israeli intelligence is dismantling every piece of rocket and whatever stuff that came over day one and trying to find the origins of where it all came from. And, you know, whether we find out all the details, that's not up to us, right? You know, uh, but, you know, supposedly, you know, 5,000 odd rockets, you know, came through in one day beneath the Patriot defense system. And uh, defense system is very good, but it's still 5,000 targets. And, you know, my mind, they had to get somehow low enough uh, for the Patriot system not to pick up. 
and uh, right. they had specific targets. They did a, a mobilization by land tunnels, uh, land overland, underland, so to speak, and in water uh, to uh, attack specific targets and then take hostages. And this is, you know, this reminds a lot of us who's been around in the seventies into the eighties uh, regarding um, hostage taking, especially mm-hmm. in the seventies. Um, and you know, I'm still uh, old enough to remember, you know, the Lebanese War. I mean, that thing was like crazy. Uh, where you basically had you know, Hezbollah, you know, out of Lebanon, you know, which is a legit terrorist slash political group that really does run a country, or well, yep. make force in a country, which is uh, Lebanon. Um, and you know, the Israeli just kind of started like you know, taking it to task uh, to countries that. Uh, support uh, terrorist acts against Israel. So, and this is brutal. I mean, we've been talking about war crimes in uh, Ukraine about Russians, you know, kidnapping children, um, you know, killing women and children. There's just food massacres of Beirut. So, you know, Beirut uh, the town they basically Russians slaughtered. I mean, now we're getting you know uh, reports uh, here and there, depending on the news media, things like you know. You know, Hamas throwing hand grenades into bomb shelters, for example. You know, just blowing up civilians inside bomb shelters with hand right. grenades. You know, kidnapping grandmas and and beating on, um, you know, women and children and and all that stuff. Um, and you know, threatening to kill you know, people uh, you know, indiscriminately for the purposes of you know, trying to get leverage. It's it's always the civilians, right, that suffer the most in in war on both sides. Yeah, this is kind of horrific in a different way. I mean, Ukraine, obviously, uh, you know, the, the first target you know, for the Russians were military targets, and then they went to a war of terror themselves by using essentially dumb weapons. You know, they're not targeting just blow up cities. Like, Maripol doesn't exist, right? It's gone, according to its right. purpose, right? They just destroy civilian populations. And, you know, in the case of Israel, uh, you know, it's, it's not a conventional invasion. It isn't like you have a line of tanks or... You know, a full blown, um, you know, military, you know, air, combined air, uh, land forces, you know, moving in, take a territory, move in. This is, you know, straight up terror. You blow stuff up, you know, grab what you want, and then and you try to figure out what their end game really is. Right. Russian end game is easily, it's to take over a country. Right. You know, Hamas's end game is to cause enormous terror, but it's not just that. You know, what do they want? more of or whatever it is. And, you know, if if uh, Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon is a participant or decide to want to participate, you know, it's going to continue to destabilization of the region and the other Arab nations uh, have to kind of figure out you know, how to navigate through this. Because mm-hmm. things are going to bring forward to the Saudis. The Israelis and the Saudis were really moving forward on, on normalization. Mm-hmm. This happens. And, you know, if the expectation is that, you know, the Israelis want to take it on the chin with all this death and destruction and says, all right, fine. Well, the answer is obviously no. But then it puts other Arab countries in kind of this diplomatic position with not just these terror groups, but, you know, countries like Lebanon and Iran, which are not, especially Iran is a problem country for the U.S. It funds terror organizations. Um, you know, how they how they manage that. Um, and, you know, you can go into all conspiracy theories where they're, you know, we could sit here for an hour talking about them, but you know, this is kind of real geopolitics. This is real geopolitics now, right? You got a hot war uh, in Europe. You got essentially a hot war again in the Middle East. Uh, you got an economic cold war with the U.S., basically the EU of China, uh, and Russia's basically not a cold war anymore in economics. It's just downright like leading on them. And then, um, you know, and then you also have. Uh, um, you know, civil wars all over the place in Africa. Myanmar is still in the midst of the civil war where uh, the Hunta military bombed a refugee site on the border of Thailand. They just blew up a refugee site. I mean, you know, this is a Myanmar. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Of course, they said, you know, they got people like the Philippines, you know, relatively small country, no big navy, just provoking the Chinese <laughs> navy. You know, inside their own territorial waters is the continuous dispute. And um, yeah, and of course, in here, we don't have a functioning House of Representatives down in Congress. So, oh, yeah, there's that, there's that too, right? <laughs> that too. So, you know, and it's going to change. I hate to say this, and I don't really want this to happen. It's going to change the face of our nation to yeah. operate because we're, you know, loaning, essentially, you know, giving people weapons on credit. Um, 
and it drains our own weapon supply, which means weapon manufacturing has to go up. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, it's on credit. So like Ukrainians are basically on credit. And whether they pay us back, it's a whole other conversation. Right. We know we have money, but again, it's going to be a credit situation, right? We're going, to, we're going to sell you weapons on credit and then you pay us later. And Israelis are pretty good in paying their bills. So I'm not too concerned about that. But yeah, I mean, you know, the U.S. taxpayers are going to have to, unfortunately, and I really don't, I hate saying this, but we really need to, uh, you know, beef up our supply of weapons because we're, give, we're basically selling them on credit. Um, and then we have to change our uh, approach of mobilization. And, uh, and you know, we got the geopolitical components um, on, on diplomacy and economics on top of that, too. So President Biden is a very, you know, tough position in, to try to manage uh, all that delicately. Um, and, you know, and it's hurting us domestically. I mean, I saw in the globe because I'm a Brandeis alumni. I don't know these professors, but I mean, you know, you know, the two kids, his, his son and his wife were, were killed in a hail gunfire. So I don't know if you guys saw the global article, but I mean, they saved the 10 year old son, but even then he was shot through the abs. Yeah. Um, you know, there are real people at home that are really affected by much yeah. pain, but also, you know, definitely, most definitely in Israel. And there's a very, oh, yeah. you know, very nice lump, you know, it's, it's, it's really disheartening. Yeah, you know, we've seen you know, we've seen rallies of uh, support, you know, for Israel on uh, the common over the weekend um, and Cambridge as well. Um, so it's, it definitely has has a has a connection to to this area in particular. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Congress needs to get their act together because they're going to have to put others. You know, of course, we have a shutdown government opportunity in about what 30 odd days are here we're running out of oh, time oh yeah it's november 17th i think is the new deadline yeah so we got like six weeks to know the government shut down and then uh you know interim though you know we got to get some temporary spending package together you know not just a military but also humanitarian aid right it's not just about guns and bullets but it's about blankets and and um, antibiotics and, and vaccines and whatnot uh, to other countries so yeah. well i know israel is a wealthy nation but you know still need to get them medicine and temporary supplies. Um, and, uh, you know, and then we have to secure the water around there too, because obviously we have, unfortunately, a vested interest in moving of fossil fuels and oil. Um, and then you got to decide about whether new embargoes are going to go in place and hyper enforce them on, on places that, uh, you know, we, if we can confirm, uh, you know, who's supporting Hamas. I mean, if it's a foreign government. Then, right. Let's figure out what you're going to do next there. And then, you know, you just, you as citizens are still out in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you got to come home and you can't fly easily because you got the Russian Ukraine war. So you kind of, you know, have very specific routes you can get out in. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I know that people have this really division of politics here, but, you know, people also got to be understanding that this job ain't easy. Right, right. Now we have, the migrant crisis still right here in Massachusetts. I think there was a team from the Department of Homeland Security this week uh, in, in Massachusetts. Yeah, uh, you know, we've actually had quite a few federal officials come in the past week, right? CDC came in, you know, some people from you know, uh, Homeland Security slash Health and Human came in. You know, so it, it's good at trying to uh, pay some attention to what's going on. Uh, as I say, say it again, I've said this uh, with you multiple times now, this is a humanitarian crisis that's being treated like a security issue. Mm. The U.S. government's, quite frankly, asinine approach where you get temporary visas and just let you loose in the planet, so to speak, let you loose in the United States or an actual plan, you know, what, what, what's going on here. Um, they, they, it's just this, this, this connection of uh, the federal government to connect the dots that you can't just give millions of people a temporary visa. Um, you, you know, even they're legally allowed to because of the law or whatever reason say, OK, well, good luck to you. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. It's not fair. It's not fair to anybody doing it that way. No, no. And, and the people who are left in that position are just going to have to wing it. And it's it, it's very unfair. Um, and, and the consequences are paid by, uh, you know, communities who want to be helpful, but, you know, under resourced because we didn't know what was coming. Right. Yeah, I think the governor is asking for $250 million uh, initially to, to deal with this. Yeah, we're going to get a lot more than $250 million. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not just us. I mean, 
you know, states all through the country are facing this, uh, mm-hmm. this humanitarian crisis. And uh, we are still the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the planet. I don't care what anybody says. Um, and, you know, we should be able to be as a collective figure this out. Mm. I wonder what Canada does, because they have quite a few um, uh, immigrants coming to Canada as well. Yeah, the Canadian immigration is kind of fascinating because people will travel through Mexico, through the United States, straight to the Canadian border. And yeah. they actually go through the same process we have regarding a refugee situation. But Canadian citizenship process is actually less onerous than mm-hmm. the U.S. regarding just not refugee and um, you know uh, requests for entry. Um, actually, most countries aren't as rigorous as us. There's only I can only think very narrow set of countries that are worse than the U.S. Yeah. Well, even the U.S. wasn't that rigorous not too long ago. No, when my parents came in the '60s, yeah, uh, was not that rigorous. Right. Um, you know, they were required to citizenship, you know, well below today's between five and 10 years. You can do it between one and three. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of us having sponsors, relative sponsors, you know, mm-hmm. win, you know, there's accountability, but, you know, it isn't like you're subject to like a social media background check, right? Right, so right. It was very different. And, uh, and the idea that undocumented illegals, what do you want to call them, you know, these undocumented folks, you know, a brand new idea. I mean, this has been going on forever in the United States. It's not novel. Uh, and, you know, people like this is novel that people come from uh, countries that have been devastated. That's not novel either. Does everyone remember the potato famine? Mm-hmm. That's right. You know, that was a humanitarian crisis. And, you know, the Irish wasn't loved when they show up here. But, I mean, they did get here, whether they came, you know, legally or undocumented. I mean, they came here. And, you know, same thing you know, during times of war, World War One, World War Two, you know, all kinds of controversy, especially World War II. Um, and then, you know, even on the southern border, I mean, you know, the, you know, the Mexican, um, South Americans, I mean, you know, it was a common trade route between California mm-hmm. and America Southwest and Texas. What we know is now is America Southwest and Texas. Mm-hmm. And they were here first. I mean, a lot of folks that lived down there were there. When the U.S. got out of that territory, the U.S. didn't throw them out. They just kind of like, well, you're here anyway. Right. You know. Right. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Look at some some of the old maps. It's fascinating to look at from the early 1800s. And you see, you, you can see it's where where Mexico came and where it is now. Yeah. they were. It was inhabited by, you know, then by, you know, descendants of the Spanish and, you know, native folks that lived there. And remember, Texas was a country for 10 years. People forget. Right. The Republic of Texas. Yes. Yeah. And then we cut up Texas to make it fit the needs of the United States with a whole bunch of provisions and then you know a lot of folks that lived there weren't all so-called americans they were texans so i mean it's it's interesting i mean you know people tend to forget that humanitarian crisis is not new and then you know we have taken territory from folks over the course of 200 years who are uh native population but we treat them like foreigners for some reason like they're invaders even though they probably lived there long before you know it was a u.s state Um, you know, after a war, it's, it's just a strange mentality people have that you think who you, what you have today has always been. That that is complete fiction. You know, what you have today is only a blink of time. You know, in the larger picture. So, but I mean, again, also times are different, right? I mean, you know, you had uh, labor, you know, different kind of labor shortages. You didn't have work visas. People just right. got jobs. It wasn't like you need permission from the government to work. They just hand you a social security number and off you go. Now you get permission to work. Uh, and it's, you know, this this kind of bureaucracy, you know, really appeared after 9-11. Ah, uh, good point, yeah. 9-11 changed everything on immigration. Suddenly everybody was dangerous and, you know, we had to close our borders. And if you weren't, you didn't have the right complexion, you were considered the enemy. Yes, you know, and let's call it what it is. I mean, you know, no one talks about, you know, undocumented Irish, you know, in Boston, but they talk about Mexicans that they, you know, to how comes home and how evil they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I still really truly believe that, you know, to talk about um, undocumented is a bit of racism fault. You know, yes. Yeah. I mean, there were Japanese internment camps in this country during World War II. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, you know, We'll get the details of this one, but I mean, you know, I found out, you know, there are definitely undocumented Albanians here. I found that out this week. Uh, much to, uh, I should be surprised, but you know, it just you know, just because the people that blend in, you know, doesn't mean that you know the 
you're gonna you're either gonna call them all one thing or another. Don't pick and choose because of the color of skin, right? And right. You must forget this. This is Massachusetts. The highest number of documents come from Canada. Oh, interesting. It's logical. The Canadian dollar is weaker than the U.S. dollar. Sure. So anything you collect on cash under the table, you bring it back to Canada. I mean, you have twenty five percent higher value money. Yeah, and it's and it's close. And it's close. You know, a lot of our French Canadians, you know, were not uncommon to come here to work the mills in Western Massachusetts. I mean, furniture was a lot of it was made by French Canadian labor. Hmm. How many more were legally or you know legally here working papers? Who the hell knows, right? No right, knows. right, right. But this this is this is kind of the the lost conversation. Undocumented folks under any particular persuasion, and, and that that's something that's not talked about. Undocumented folks can look like anyone. It's true. Um, and yet they're resuming the wall. Well, hey, I mean, yeah, the media doesn't help us, obviously, because they, you know, they tend to pick and choose the crisis centers. Yeah. Uh, and even though there are articles about, you know, non South American or Central American undocumented, you can find them, you know, about European undocumented, Canadian undocumented. I'm, I'm sorry, but it doesn't create the great news. No, it's true. Yeah, it, it's, it doesn't make for, you know, dramatic video and flashy headlines. No, it doesn't help the talking heads on cable TV. It right. makes money on, you know, advertising, which is fine, but incites, you know, people so they can increase viewership. And, um, and uh, you know, we, we have a bad habit of, of beating on people that can't defend themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not documented. It's just, you know, happened to women. It's happened to uh, people with disabilities. This has happened to people of, of sexual orientation. I mean, uh, it's always the easy target to pick someone that's different. Take it from a guy who's, who knows what it's like to be different. Uh, it's always easy to pick on what it's different, at least likely defend, at least likely able to defend themselves. And the majority yeah. of us feels like their power. You know, uh, uh, I always was brought up, you know, an idea that your position of authority, you know, uh, you have higher responsibility not to abuse that authority. But you look at behavior of people like con uh, in Congress and you know, local politicians, even you know, around the country, and not just the U.S., but around the world, mm. they use their, you know, uh, soapbox, you know, to demonize folks or uh, incite crowds and riots for their personal political gain. And of course, they have straight up corruption, right? George Santos, again, you know, he's still credit cards from donors. You got that uh, senator, the senior senator was this Mendez from, from, what's his name, from... Can't remember his name now. From New Jersey, who had gold bars. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I mean, come on, people. I was reading something recently about um, why do people seem so angry right now? And you know, there were uh, a list of things, but the number one thing was money. You know, people feel like they don't have enough money, or that there's just a wide disparity in the wealth gap in this country and that's creating animosity and and generating anger i agree with that i mean the wealth gap has statistics all statistics will show it's great and wide and reaganomics does not work trickle down economics doesn't work i know nobody likes to pay taxes people should pay their fair share of taxes but it's 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 really bizarre like you talked about before about the 62f issue last week yeah. you know we made equal benefits if if it ever happens and everyone gets equal share as opposed to Proportional pay to taxes. And I get, again, emails from constituents like, oh, you can't change this. I look, I was like, you actually benefit from this equity uh, component because I look at your home address. I can, I can find and figure out, you know, <laughs> your, your general income status based on where you live. I mean, right. I do live here, people. I do have a general clue. Not like I know exactly what everyone makes, but I have a general idea, right, based on in your home. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, why are you defending rich people? Right. It's it's like you will receive a benefit, but now you're lobbying me against your best interest because somebody told you, you know, that you have to be anti taxes. Right. Like, as opposed to looking for your best interest, right? It's 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 like the current tax package. You know, it's designed, you know, vast majority is designed around working people in Quincy, helps the vast majority of people uh, out there. Um and of course there's some provisions that you know will also you know help out some industries such as dairy, right? Which is a big part of our economy still. So again, it's always a down, you know, delicate balancing act between various things to, to mm -hmm. make 
uh, palatable for the entire legislature to vote on. Trust me. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't have a dairy farm. However, my Western Mass friends do. Sure. Yeah. You need your votes, folks, right? Um, and, and that's that's the nature of being you know, a diverse state. You have to accom- accommodate everybody in the state the best you can because everyone's representing this part of the country. So, but yeah, I mean, it's it's weird. So yeah, the income divide's real. You know, I we talked a lot about it before. I'm feeling the pinch like you am. I've cut back on my polo salts of water immensely. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've cut back on, I have my limited diet, it makes it hard for me to get snacks. I've cut back on a lot of my own snacks. Mm-hmm. I finally bought a bag of chips for the first time in like four months. Um, and you know, looking for the sales, right? Right. Maybe you kind of get your hand on and if it's like a non-perishable item that I can buy discount, I'm buying a lot of it now. Sure. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, what about the sriracha shortage, right? Oh, really? Oh, you never heard about this? No. Because there's a shortage of uh, chilies, the sriracha company that makes, you know, the one of the rooster on it. Yeah. The green cap. Uh, yeah. You know, now, point. Great story about, you know, immigrant story being in a big success, but he, they use, uh, they don't use chilies from Southeast Asia. They actually use chilies from South America and Central America. And because of combination of climate change, the tariffs, you know, all this stuff, geopolitics between trade nations and the Trump administration, all this stuff kind of came to a head on like so many different factors. And then there was a huge shortage and you couldn't make any sriracha. So you can find one, like, you go look on eBay for the sriracha. It's like, you know, Ridiculous. I mean, people selling it for like thirty dollars a bottle. I mean, it's, really? It's, oh yeah. I'm gonna, check, I'm gonna have to check my pantry and see if I have any I can sell. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's really nuts. And then you know, my other friends, and, you know, colleagues in the legislature from from Southeast Asia, they, you know, they can't get fish sauce because you know the high cost of shipping things overseas, oh. plus you know different supply chain issues uh, overseas, you know, has resulted in a shortage of things like fish sauce coming over. Interesting. Yeah, you know, the whole stop buying fish sauce. The whole trade picture is so delicate. It's almost like a, a house of cards. One goes down and they all go down. It is. And, you know, even things like cocoa and vanilla, you know, coming out of Africa and South America. I mean, you may have noticed that your vanilla prices have gone up and it you know, goes into ice cream and and baked goods and, and candy and so forth. So, you know, the, you know, there is this global implication for trade and tariffs and the Biden administration hasn't really removed a lot of these tariffs. So, keep some of these prices elevated again tariffs don't help you and me because we mm-hmm. pay the tariff not the foreign country it's you know it's to make prices on foreign goods so high that you're going to buy domestic instead I see. things like vanilla is not a domestic product right yeah so artificial vanilla is your is your better priced option um yeah. but if you want natural vanilla bean or have a product in it you're going to pay more money because the this is a simple example of tariffs, right? You're paying for it, you know, at the store uh, because there's no real competitor locally. Mm-hmm. Again, this yeah. is like crazy trade policy. I don't understand at the federal level. It's like you you, you want to create tariffs against competition of similar products against a domestic company, not on raw goods that you don't have a competitor in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You you do want to bring those prices down so people will buy them. <laughs> Well, yes. All you're yeah. doing is hurting. They're just hurting us. I mean, this was the Trump administrator tariffs. I always scratched my head about this when I started reading articles about the impacts of certain sectors. And I'm like, this makes no sense. It, 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 again, trade wars are designed to protect domestic businesses against foreign competition by discouraging local folks from buying more expensive foreign product because right. they made it right. more expensive. Yeah, you put, you raise this. Raise the tariffs on imported vehicles if you want people to buy domestically. Yeah, that's the conversation started about electric vehicles because the Chinese are going to be exporting foreign vehicles at some point, especially electric vehicles, and undercut. You know, the local manufacturing would be the big three or a Tesla, but even you know Volkswagen and Honda. They have massive manufacturing plants in Massachusetts. They're actually made in America. Yep, most, most of them. Of them yeah. yeah, you don't realize how much it, you know these foreign car manufacturers are made in America because they're. Oh, yeah. Processes here, they make it here, so you know they'll be impacted as well by uh, you know a flood of Chinese lower cost electric vehicles. Yeah, uh, you know they're going to be like, okay, where do we fit into the tariff picture because they're foreign, but they make everything here. Right. Okay. Right. Source. Well, almost all, the intellectual property is locally the sourced. We'll put yeah. It that well, way. exactly. Yeah. I guess it's you have to follow the money. Where does the money flow back to? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, intellectual property isn't locally sourced. 
But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's easier for them to you know hire a local steel mill uh, than it is to you know, import from Germany, right? Of course, yeah. So, um, you know, there, there is you no know, conversation about whether or not you're going to increase foreign tariffs on on electric vehicles to twenty five to fifty percent. Then the country that the tariffing against is going to respond against your own companies in the U.S. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it becomes this kind of like turf war. So no, that conversation is real, guys. I mean, as as the electric market, the vehicle market shifts around, um, and of course, you know, your electric vehicle car tax at the federal level requires it to be predominantly made in the United States, right? Including the raw raw elements component. Um, Interesting. Yeah. You know, so it locks out you know, f- you know basically Chinese vehicles they could buy using the using the federal tax credit. Um, you know, this, this is going to be coming to play probably in the next, well, well, we'll see if they try to do this during an election cycle. How's that sound? Uh, good points. <laughs> good points. Yeah. Um, what is going on with the cannabis industry, Massachusetts techie? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a saturation point. I mean, okay. well, there's been a lot of conversation, you know, and we did some stuff regarding equity to allow smaller business, particularly minority owned women, women business to enter the cannabis market. Um, you know, the federal government is moving forward and allowing opening lines of credit, which is a big problem because we can't use the banking system. And the banking system by nature is interstate and the federal a federal crime on cannabis is interstate. You know, no bank's going to put themselves at risk yeah. uh, for one cannabis shop, um, you know, against a federal, federal crime. So, I mean, if the feds continue moving forward on, you know, opening up lines of credit, the Congress eventually decriminalizes uh, cannabis because the you're in the country is moving that direction. So is Canada. Excuse me. So there's this already this movement existing. You know, at what point does you know this reach a certain you know threshold the feds need to respond? Locally, yeah, I mean we, we want more uh, small minority women owned business to participate. Um but again startup cost is very high. You can't get credit, right? And that means you have to get cash help from venture capitalists. You have to top top it together your own money and get through the regulatory process and everything else. But like, you know, to me, at some point, every market hits a saturation. It's the walls mm-hmm. of economics, right? Eventually you have sufficient supply and it meets demand. Mm-hmm. There's really no more room for anybody else unless you have a massive price reduction. And the concern a lot of us had was because the uh, few shops, few supply make black market more attractive because they're undercutting, undercutting the legal market. And of course, you've heard of fentanyl in everything, which yes. is which just makes it scary, right? Yes, yes. Then, you know, supply has risen, demand hasn't grown, and eventually they equalize, and at some point the existing market has to undercut, which then will undercut the black market, which then eventually over a long time will shrink the size of the black market. Okay. And uh, again, fentanyl, scary. So yeah. And deadly. Deadly. So the question is, how do you manufacture the customers? My argument's always been that it isn't like you're sitting at home teaching kids how to use pot. I mean, if you are great. I don't know what to tell you about, you know, how to how to raise your children, but that's your decision, not mine. Um, but I mean, I just don't see the vast majority of parents, you know, teaching the kids use pot, like giving them like scotch at like age fourteen. Here, learn how to drink this stuff, right? Right. Um, you know, I, I just don't see the, the 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 creation of a market in the same way. Um, and eventually, you know, there'll be an equalization of the market. I think. Mm-hmm. Has reached that point. Now, what's going on at Cannabis Co- Control Commission with Shane O'Brien and and Deb Goldberg? That's a legal case that's pending. Yes, I'm not even going to comment on this one. It's well, it's because there is nothing to comment on. It's there's no information out there. Yeah, and you know it's a legal proceeding at this point. So I mean, I don't dare say anything because I can't tell you what the facts of anything are until uh, the media reports come out. You know, once they start this process on on what's reviewed in court, right? But a whole different internal function of the, of the of the regulatory agency um yes. but yeah i mean to me a lot of stuff that we utilize like sports betting we talked about this before it reaches a certain equilibrium um there'll be spikes during certain times of the year i mean you know obviously you guys know i deal with the alcohol industry a lot um there's that there's equilibrium there um and change competition whether it be the rest shipping of wine or gold puff um and then you know obviously during certain times of the year july 4th you know Graduation season, wedding sure. season. Yep, Super Bowl, whatever. Yep. Yeah, the, the industry will have these natural, you know, rise and spikes. And, um, and then, you know, but I mean, tourist season, whatnot. So, you know, again, I, I do a lot of regulatory industries. 
you know, I do understand how the markets work in that area. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but, you know, I, I truly believe, you know, these regular new regulatory industries were created, you know, equilibrium is going to occur. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, uh, you know, we haven't talked about it in a long time is, um, the unemployment uh, program in Massachusetts techie. You mean the, uh, workforce development program? Yes. At the, um, Quincy center. Yes. Is it working? Oh, okay. I was like, was something <laughs> go wrong there that I didn't, I missed it a new service? <laughs> no, no, not at all. No. I would have told you that. I don't, you know me, I don't, I don't set you up. If the, I would have told you. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a good time to remind people it's there. Yeah. Uh, if you're un you receive unemployment benefits, you do have to be engaged in some form of workforce development, whether you're actively in job or getting workforce training, it has to be accounted for. Uh, those who've been on unemployment know everybody in COVID season, in 2020 knows all about it at this point right yeah. uh, because, you know you had 20 almost 20 percent of the population at various points of unemployment benefits um and there was some waivers regarding the fact it was more difficult to to get accountability on i don't know, going to the office safely to, to yep. uh to demonstrate you're actually meeting the education slash looking for work requirements unemployment's still low in massachusetts right it's still under four percent nationally yep. it's under four percent but there are more. I mean, I'm getting more calls in the office seeking unemployment assistance, mass health assistance. You know, these are not COVID calls uh, from 2020. These are brand new folks. Um, and, you know, it is getting pinched. And uh, I know that uh, um, uh, Chairman Cutler, Chairman of Workforce and Labor, uh, you know, did a visit down there. I couldn't go. I was tied up in the state. I was talking about C Street um, with the OT regarding C Street Safety Project, which... Mm -hmm. Should kick off, I hope, sometime in the spring. Okay. Uh, a lot of disturbances coming on C Street, folks, starting the spring if if everything's on schedule. But um, yeah, the chairman, you know, Cutler went around and uh, you know to different workforce sites and discussed you know the latest versions on uh, education requirements, accountability, and uh, what they can do. And you know, there's going to be an uptick over time. Yeah, it's it's almost kind of designed that way, right, uh, by the feds. Yeah, and also the state. I mean, the federal government mm -hmm. you know, require increased workforce uh, accountability on the unemployment benefits, um, as well as SNAP benefits. So, you know, receiving stuff is greater accountability for that. Uh, on the flip side, you know, Massachusetts uh, for a very long time, before even I got into government, it's how long mm -hmm. it's been, has required uh, folks to be participating in some kind of education and have to mm -hmm. demonstrate actively seeking a job. And we actually have a very generous time frame for benefits. Uh, we really do. So... You know, I have friends, and you may have friends on unemployment, whether they talk about it or not. You know, we get calls from my friends, like, how do we do compliance? I mean, right. <laughs> brought back to my job. People are like, right. hey, how do I do this to make sure we're okay? I was like, okay. And then, uh, but also be careful with these numbers. Seasonal workers uh, do go on unemployment. Oh, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. And this is the time of year they'll start to apply. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you have seasonal and, and non seasonal adjustment on unemployment numbers. Yeah. So yep. generally what you see in the news is not is the um uh seasonally adjusted. If you if you adjust for seasonally, the number goes up. But it's yes. a temp the temporary spike reflecting the, the seasonality of of uh, the tourist industry and hospitality industry. So right. yep. as we get, you know, it's October eleventh today, in about a month's time or less, you know, Tony's clan shop and clan box will close. Um, you know, they go to seasonal unemployment. Right, but places down the Cape, uh, you know, similar. Um, even um, school bus drivers, you know, over the summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seasonal unemployment. Yeah. So you the, the, that's why I have the two numbers. And you got the payroll yeah. farm numbers, which is also different because those are, oh, yeah. uh, again, temporary workers doing different agricultural seasons throughout the United States. Yep. Yeah. Payroll farm numbers is part of that, too. We don't deal with it the same way because we don't. we have a farm industry, but we're not Iowa. So our, our seasonality in terms tends to be focused on hospitality, less on mm -hmm. that. Yep, yep. It's uh, yeah, exactly. It's not as big an agricultural state as, as as others. Although I was out in the western part of the state this past weekend, um, and it's just it's remarkable how different it is, uh, just geographically and culturally. Yeah, and I, oh yeah, I mean, you know, one of the benefits of my job is to travel the state every so often, uh, visiting industries or visiting legislators. You know, uh, to uh, see what's going on and now that we're out of covid ish sort of i don't know um you know i'll be i'll be looking forward to do more um 
trips around the state to see my colleague's stuff in my capacity as a chair. Um, you know, I hope to go to more conferences, um, something I really neglected um, early on in my chairmanship because I was just up to my neck in insanity the end when COVID hit. Um, and I really have neglected the ability to go to educational opportunities. So I'm hoping maybe I'll get to do that if I can find time and decide, and decide the schedule that we live in. Um, but, uh, you know, we appropriated $20 million plus in assistance post floods for uh, the farms in, you know, central Western Mass, particularly yep. besides closing in on New Hampshire, Vermont border, which is basically just flooded out. And agriculture, you know, you get enough water, besides killing the plants, you can get mold. Right, exactly. Yeah, all, all, all kinds of things. Yeah, and that's their livelihood. Yeah, so we provide, provide some direct financial assistance in the last supplement of the budget. Again, it doesn't mean the same thing to us in Quincy, uh, but, you know, it means a lot to, you know, to our <clears throat> colleagues in Western Mass. And mm -hmm. Organic farming is a big part of our economy in Massachusetts, too. I mean, it's not like Iowa, California, or, right. you know, but, I mean, cranberries is still number two in the country, you know, in terms of putting out cranberries. But, you know, still apple picking is a big time here. It's a huge apple bumping crop. I, I can't eat apples, stone fruit allergy. But, I mean, people have told me that, you know, taking kids and seniors, I, mean, I help sponsor uh, um, a van with the Asian American Service Association to take senior citizens out for a day on apple picking. Uh, I'm hearing that people have way too many apples now. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> well, I mean, you can sauce them, you can side them. I'm sure you could come up with You many can put them in pie. <laughs> I know. Uh, so... Uh, but yeah, it's it's been a bumper apple crop, right? So, um, but other things were, you know, I obviously, you know, I heard watermelon was really good this year, but I didn't seem I didn't see see that many in the store for some reason. Uh, again, I was like, I heard about it, but I was like, I'm not seeing it. Um, I just picked the wrong day to show up at the store. Um, <laughs> they they bought them out before you got there. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's an example of us working with folks in other parts of the country. I mean, other parts of the state. You know that that needs help, and uh, you know the folks in Quincy probably to support folks in Western Mass. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, we're at the end of the hour, Jackie. Sure. Uh, you can find me at six one seven seven two 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 three seven zero six one seven seven two 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 three seven zero. We are open. You know, come visit. You want to take a tour to State House? I strongly encourage people to do so as, as uh, this part of tourist season slows down. Um, you can email me at tackey.chan and mayhouse.gov, tackey.chan and mayhouse.gov. Um, and then uh, you can look at me through my social media at State Representative uh, Tacky Chan. You can see pictures of me from Korea Day, for example, uh, that we had on Friday, um, as well as mlegislature.gov. You can feel free to look up your own bills, find out the chairman, uh, submit testimony to various committees' websites. Um, and of course, you can look at our old archives of not just sessions, but a whole bunch of public hearings we've been having. Uh, I love the fact people say we're not working. Well, go look at our public hearings. That's we're work, folks. Yep. <laughs> it is work. And uh, tackychan.org is our uh, typical page for resources. You need to find a phone number and direct people there. And of course, you know, uh, X at tacky chan yes you can tell the pause because i'm still trying to adjust to x at tacky chan uh, is the twitter account and of course you know got a problem called joe at cuba tv of a question let's see if <laughs> uh and uh i'll be sure and forward it to tacky <laughs> yep and, uh you can listen to joe in the morning obviously he has his podcast in the morning for the you know five to eight minutes of uh, condensed news and quincy you all need to know about during the day Appreciate it, Jackie. Have a wonderful week, and we'll check in next week. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you all soon.